Right, well, I wrote my memoirs uh, because I've always wanted to write books. My dad used to write books. In fact, he translated the whole of Chekhov for the Oxford University Press and took him 35 years to do. My brother writes archaeological books. Uh, he's a professor at Durham University, and I've always wanted to write a book. And uh, in fact, if you'd asked me at the age of 10, uh, you could either be in a band that sold, sold a million records and went around the world sort of eight times, or you could actually write a book, get it, find someone foolish enough to publish it and actually sell some copies, I probably would actually write the book. I'm very lucky because I have a very privileged upbringing, you know, like my parents were both quite middle class and we had quite a privileged upbringing and as I said I'm the youngest of seven and the thing is that my dad was like an Oxford academic so he was very clever but he was also quite funny and my mum always encouraged all of us to be good at different things so like my eldest brother Peter was good at maths next brother Richard became an archaeologist, my next brother Martin studied classics, my brother Andrew became an engineer, Vicky sort of taught people, Helen's a social worker and I play music so uh, you know with that kind of background which you're very lucky to have, um, although you know better than anyone else it could have been anything really, could have been an actor or could have been a politician or I don't know could have been, a, I could, could literally have been anything really. Musically, the highlight of my career is still having a career. I mean, uh, if you've ever played, you know, if you've ever made a record or you've ever been on top of the pops or you've ever had your face on the front of the enemy or whatever, just to, to how it's still have a career now is the best part of your career because, you know, a band doesn't belong or an artist doesn't belong to themselves, they belong to the audience. Well, I think all music inspires you. I think all music does it. it. Either positively inspires you, as in you think like The Doors or, you know, or Sex Pistols or Nirvana or Arcade Fire, and you think, oh, yeah, I'd like to make music like that. Or it inspires you, as in you think, God, that's absolutely garbage. It's difficult to say that. I mean, I think about, I've said it before, playing solo, you've only got yourself to let yourself down. You know, if you're playing in a band, you can lift yourself higher, but someone else can... You know, pull you down a, a few years ago within spirals and it wasn't anyone's fault and I'm not complaining I'm just we were playing at like two o'clock in the afternoon at the V Festival and um, someone out of the band had a bit too much to drink because you know we never played at two o'clock in the afternoon and when we played we weren't very good and afterwards we, had, we did this kind of signing tent and people were coming so oh, you were great and I was going well no we weren't really because <laughs> someone in the band was a bit drunk and so uh, I don't know if that answers your question but I mean I, I'm sure I've let people down I'm not, that's not a big go at someone in the band but if you play solo there's no one to let you down apart from yourself I think most good bands create their own fashion and then other people follow it it's the kind of dull bands who just follow what everyone else is doing. I mean, you'd have to ask Craig because he was a drummer and he was into, you know, we did She Comes in the Fall and the drums on that was influenced by cloud bursting. And then, you know, we did Drag Me Down and uh, both Martin and Craig, you know, they, you know, they listened to Stetsasonic and JB All Stars, you know, live across the tracks. And so that kind of offbeat build comes from that. So some of that's to do with Craig. Also, when I joined the band in 1989, you know, you had Craig, who I think was like 15. And you had Clint, he was like 29. So I mean, there's an immense age difference in the band and an enormous musical knowledge. I think sort of modern, modern critiques of society and culture would say that we all create cultures, I suppose, but people aren't necessarily that conscious of it. I mean, I think the, 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 the Manchester movement, I mean, I didn't create it, I was part of it. I mean, I think Clint was probably doing a lot of things. I mean, I was being in bands and I moved here sort of 28 years ago whenever it was but I think that the you know the thing about that whole culture was that there was a lot of good things about it but there were some bad things about it as well you know because I gave out flyers outside the Heaton Park gigs and uh, such a wonderful vibe and they were so successful but there were some people there who just need to move on a little bit they've kind of invested their lives in, in spiral carpets or Happy Mondays or Stone Roses or o Oasis and it's like actually at some point you need to develop you need to don't look back you need to go on mm. don't go on liking the band but you need to you know you're not 13 when you're 37 you're not 14 when you're 45 and you know I'm writing a book which means I'm doing something different from what I did 20 24 years ago and I think generally some people will need to move on a little bit uh, I've got into box sets I mean I've been looking through the prisoner box set uh, I'm work I've watched all the Sopranos because my father passed away two years ago and I kind of inherited all the Sopranos DVDs and people say 
it's the best TV show in the world. I don't know if it is or it isn't. My, my favourite TV shows of all time are stuff like the original Avengers, Sopranos, you know, and I'm watching I, Claudius at the moment, which actually I think they kind of borrowed a little bit for, for the Sopranos because it's kind of, well, it's just families and friends doing one another in for political advantage. It's a bit like running the Olympics or something. It never goes away, does it, you know? Uh, Reading Festival in 1990, GMEX, 21st of July 1990, uh, playing Glastonbury in 2003, on After the Darkness, to start raining. There's a lot of good gigs, really. I mean, I'd probably miss the innocence of not being aware of how things work. I mean, like, if you look at, um, you know, I mean, like, get more and more drawn into politics. I talk about it a lot on Facebook and I talk about it on Twitter. But like you know, you know you look at something political like um, nothing to do with music. You look at workfare, where you know the government. And it was started by the Labour government, to be fair. You know, at any one time they've got forty thousand people, or long ter long term unemployed people, stacking shelves in supermarkets for no money. So you know, as someone, I sound very conservative saying this, but someone who's a taxpayer, I'm paying for people to not get paid to work. And the supermarkets at the same time will be also doing enormous tax write-offs for employing people who aren't getting paid. So that means at any one time there's another 40,000 people in the UK who are on the unemployment register because they're continuously being exploited by the biggest, most richest companies in the whole of the country to exploit everyone. Um, and so I, I wasn't like that maybe back in the day, but I see that that's the sort of thing. I'm, I'm less naive now about the way things work. And to me, just stop that program right now. Just employ people to work in supermarkets. You know, I hate to say it that I, something I have got, again, you know, this is the thing about being a little bit more cynical and less naive, which I quite like when I was younger, I was more naive. But look at charity. Charity really doesn't work. It really doesn't work because you've got all these people putting their time and their money and their emotions into doing something. And it's always with a great spirit but at the end of the day Tesco's turns over six billion pounds so all the charity does means that enormous companies make more money so the thing is you should just tax the enormous companies for their money to pay for the things and an example is like soldiers you know this is very political what I'm saying I'm nothing against people who are soldiers I've nothing against people who fight for their country and I'm very glad that they do it because I wouldn't be very good at it and they're very brave and good on them but is it really for people to raise money to help soldiers who come back from countries who've got limbs missing or post-traumatic disorder? Shouldn't the country be paying for that? And if the country can't pay for that, then maybe we shouldn't get involved in wars because that's part of the cost of going to war. So I've got quite, you know, so now I'm a little bit more cynical. And you know, I wouldn't, I'm not going to start having a fight with someone in a pub about it, but I'm not sure that charity is the answer to things. And, you know, while you've got these two or three companies making billions of pounds every year, they clearly aren't being taxed enough, and that's where the money goes. If you do that charity thing, that money just goes to an enormous, great, big corporation somewhere. So I think we need a bit more social justice. And I'm not sure I would have been... I think I would have been a bit more self-obsessed, if that's possible, as a singer out of a band. I would have been more self-obsessed back in the day, and now it's just being middle-aged and grumpy. I'm more aware of how things don't work and how maybe how things should work so you know I'm not, I'm not I don't you know I've got a big thing about you know the Olympics LOCOG who's the organising committee uh, the musicians union which I'm in and which I really support you know they've got this thing about the fact that they just wanted thousands of musicians to perform there for free they're making billions of pounds out of this event and that's the new thing you know the Jubilee you get people in to provide security you don't pay them uh, you own a charity that also, under a different age, it's also owns the, the employment company. They get paid a million pounds and then they don't pay the people who are doing the work at all. How does that help anyone? In fact, you'd be better off not doing the thing at all. So there's a lot of that going on. So we need a bit more social justice, I think. I don't mean like a big revolution, but we need a, we need a bit more social justice, peacefully. Uh, well, I really like Will Self. He's like the, he's like a novelist who used to be on uh, Shooting Stars. I just think he's very bright, and what he says, I think, it's very funny. He says a lot of things to wind people up. It's a bit like me. Um, hmm, who else? Uh, probably all going to be writers. If they could be, they don't have to be people alive or dead. Um, oh God, that's a really difficult question to answer. Um, who else do I like? I'll think of million. But I'd quite like to meet um, Stephen Moffat, who's the guy who's the script editor, producer of Doctor Who. I'd quite like to meet him. 
because uh, I really like Doctor Who. I can, I can tell millions of people are groaning in the background now. Um, and I said it would be nice to meet Jimi Hendrix, wouldn't it, if he was still alive? Well, I'd, my first stint in Old Trafford was from 1988 until 1999. I lived in Burnage for six years, and then I came back in 2006, and I've been living here ever since. We call it the OT. We don't call it Old Trafford. You're gonna, when you're down with the ute like I am, you've got to call it o, the OT. Only it sounds very snobby, as him, but I just think Trafford's nice because it's a nice old Edwardian or Victorian houses. It's a nice place. It's very diverse. There's a lot of different people. Like on the street here's all different creeds and different from all around the world it's that, that's a nice thing and people get on really well uh, yeah I probably wouldn't be so fat if I'd thought about it if I could have uh, started going down the gym or maybe doing uh, yoga or something like that you know it's like um, I mean I so ended up sort of getting divorced one time I'm like remarried now but you know that's never a good thing is it when you've got kids and stuff I mean but not musical regrets no, really I mean I have a very fated life and a very easy life it's not like being a bricklayer or a nurse or a social worker I've had a pretty my adult life has been a work avoidance scheme which seems to be you have to work quite hard to avoid working it's, it's a kind of a bit of a paradox but no I've had a very fated life it's life's too short just don't look back just look forward Uh, but I, I don't have a favourite track really. I don't. I mean, I like "Realise" by Flaming Lips. I think that's a good song because it can it communicates a really essential, universal, uh, emotional truth. You know that we're all going to die. So you better grab that existential moment, and it does it in a way which isn't cheesy. It doesn't do it in a way that you've ever really seen it done before. So that's a that's a good piece of art. You know, and someone said to me like, "Is it useful? Is it useful to musicians?" And I said, "Well, you know, I suppose that if." I don't know, the wheel fell off your amp, you could see it under your amp and then your amp would be level. But I don't think that, I don't have a favourite song because I think with art it's, it's, it's not a hierarchical thing, it's not about being useful, it's about being art, you know. There's three questions here in the fire leaf. Why shouldn't you sip open drinks backstage at a concert? That's the question, the answer is John Craven. Uh, the second one is what happens when you give a sucker an even break, the answer is Oasis. And the third one is how old was Tom when he tried to burn his house down? So the answer to that is 10. So I think you get the idea from the book's not I mean, not the most serious book that's ever been published in the history of books, but so, so, so be it, I'd say. Priceless. You can't live without it. Uh, buy five copies of it each. <laughs> give them to people you don't like. 